Okay, it looks live, David. Is that a good sign? Uh, it looks like, just like earlier this week, we lost David from the very beginning of the broadcast. Um, so I, I suppose in the event that that continues to happen, um, we may want to uh, postpone or reschedule. But we do have a couple viewers, it looks like, right now. We'll be seeing the live stream you know, in a few seconds. There's a bit of a, of a delay. So um, I can go ahead and get us started, if you like. And David is back. I am back. So I'll let him take it away. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. Um, so like what, what was I saying? <laughs> <laughs> um, anyways, so we have Jeff and Lisa both here today. I'm not sure where it cut off when I was talking. Um, but Jeff and Lisa are both here today. Um, and so they will just be answering any final questions you have about the course. Um, Anything to wrap it up, if you still have uh, questions about specific content, um, or even just questions about them specifically, about their work, about space systems engineering as a whole, um, please do ask those. Um, and we'll try and get through as many of your questions as we can today. So um, Jeff and Lisa, welcome. Thank you for being here. Um, we're great that we can kind of wrap up the course with, with uh, Lisa, who created the your course content initially, and Jeff, who kind of spearheaded this adoption process. Um, really glad to have both of you here. So w one question that um, I was kind of wondering that maybe we can start off with is that, so both of you have systems engineering backgrounds, but it seems that both of you have kind of transitioned into other roles. Jeff, you, it seems like you do more project management stuff these days, um, and Lisa as, as the technical assistant to the NASA Deputy Associate Administrator. Um, but it seems like there are opportunities for systems engineers to grow into other fields. Um, do you see is that do you see yourself as an example of that, or I guess as an exception to the broader rule? Or uh, Jeff, maybe you can start with with the opportunities. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, David. So uh, yeah, it's a good question, and I think. Lisa and I have taken very different career paths, but we both kind of started out doing a lot of system engineering analyses and stuff like that. So we're probably two good examples of what you can do if you come into the field and you really like aerospace and you have an interest in being that organizer, coordinator kind of person and, and seeing the big picture kind of person. So um, I, I jokingly, I was trying to think, Lisa and I were exchanging emails over the last week about something, and I thought about it, and I thought, actually, I. Lisa's world has been more the white-collar version of NASA. I've been the blue-collar version, right? So, so it's like you could take engineering in two different directions. So and I'll let Lisa talk about what she's been able to do in, in more recent years. But she's worked a lot at the very strategic level, and I think system engineers have that kind of big-picture capability to kind of move into that world. Where Then the other side, though, as a system engineer, becoming a project manager is kind of a perfect example of what you can do, too, because as a project manager, more down in an individual product project role, you still have to be able to understand all the engineering stuff. You have to be able to challenge the engineering team because they're spending your money. They're you know they're causing you schedule delays, and so having an engineering background is the perfect thing to move into project management. So so I think you, you can kind of go either way. I think it just depends on um, what part of the system engineering life cycle you enjoy the most, right? So I'm working at the part of the life cycle where we're going through and building the flight hardware and getting it ready for launch. And I think I like that part where you have this very discrete endpoint. So, you know, we've got three to four years to get ready for launch. And we have to go from phase A, B type analysis all the way through flight hardware development, testing, and launch in a really short period of time. So I think that, that kind of excitement and drama and stress it's something that I really enjoy, so I think that's where I kind of gravitated to. So before this, I worked in flight operations where similarly you're making decisions and pressure situations and the implications are very real because the satellite's in orbit. You're trying to make a decision on how to fix the battery to keep it living longer, or, uh, to do a maneuver to get it in the right position. And so I think I kind of gravitated towards that environment because I really like that kind of tangible result of engineering analysis where you really got to see the product right away. So 
but yeah, we we definitely have done similar things in our careers, and then we've kind of done different things along the way. So I'll at least talk about some of the different things she's done. So. Thank you, Jeff. So taking off on that idea of the white collar uh, promotion, uh, I have spent the recent part of my career at NASA headquarters. And unlike working at a center like Goddard Space Flight Center where Jeff is, at headquarters we are looking at the agency writ large. And our responsibilities involve, uh, as Jeff said, strategic planning, really looking at what future missions should NASA do, but also other aspects of missions beyond the technical side. So getting the, the budget financing from Congress, getting the um, support from the White House, uh, working with the communications folks and outreach aspects of getting a mission started, working with the National Academies of Science Mission to make sure it's part of their uh, strategic plans for the country in a particular venue of science. And so at headquarters, you're not only playing the engineer who needs to understand what that mission is, but all those other aspects of getting a mission of Approved, funded, uh, started, initiated, and even picking which center should manage it. Should it be Goddard Space Flight Center? Uh, so in that regard, as a systems engineer, because I've been good at looking at the big picture and how do you put those pieces together, uh, gravitating up to a more senior position at headquarters where you're looking at it at a much higher level, but it's still putting the pieces together and make sure it's a viable program or a viable mission. Um, why people get out of systems engineering, it really often comes down to getting a promotion. So being a project manager like Jeff or doing what I'm doing at headquarters often means you get a promotion. And so it comes with more responsibilities, more exposure, more opportunity. Um, and everyone wants that in their career. So over a 20, 30 year career, we've gravitated out of our you know, original work. But not everybody does that. Uh, many people just want to stay being engineers and they're often at the centers. Uh, at headquarters, you'll find most people are more at the um, big picture strategy management level. Yeah, and so like from a center perspective, I really appreciate that there are people like Lisa at NASA headquarters because you think of NASA, right, it's not just, um, it is a big federal bureaucracy, it has to be, right, so, but you want to know that the people in decision making roles really have a good engineering background and really understand the decision process they're going through, right, so you really want to have people with a system engineering background at the headquarters level to make sure the agency is making wise decisions because Somebody at the at the center, like myself, is going to have to execute. So if decisions are made bad up front about how much a mission would cost or how complex it's going to be or whether we should pursue this mission versus that mission, it, it might turn out terribly and it's going to be the people at the center who are going to live that dream or, or nightmare or whatever it happens to be. So, so I think that's the real value of system engineers. I think a lot of system engineers are like afraid of like a NASA headquarters environment because they're like, oh, that's where bureaucrats are and that's... But it's like, well, no, not at NASA. I mean, there, there's a certain amount of bureaucracy that comes with it, but there's a critical function. This is a very technical field that we all work in to have people who really understand this stuff making decisions. So, so throughout the history of NASA, some of the best engineers in the agency have matriculated to headquarters to take on leadership roles. So, so I think it's not, you know, it's not like you uh, lose all your engineering capability when you go to headquarters. You put it to a different kind of use at a strategic level. And in fact, I'll add one more thing to that. NASA's looking at an asteroid retrieval mission where we go retrieve an asteroid, bring it into the lunar vicinity, and have astronauts actually encounter the asteroid. And we have two different concept teams thinking about ways you would actually retrieve this asteroid. And so those teams bring their ideas to headquarters and it's us senior leadership that get to sit in the meeting and hear these different, very different concepts. You want engineers in those leadership positions so we can ask the difficult questions and challenge those concepts 
and hopefully lead the engineering concept teams to better thoughts, better design ideas, and then they come back to us. And this particular mission is very early in pre-phase A, right, as you're learning in systems engineering. So it's very conceptual, but this is a way we can steer it so it's more viable because those of us at headquarters still have to get the funding approved and really have to sell this mission because it's just in that concept phase. So, so it just depends. So, so as a system engineer, you could go either way, or any one of three ways, right? You could stay as a system engineer, and I work with a senior system engineer on my project that's been a system engineer for probably 25 to 30 years now. He loves that job. He just moves from mission to mission to mission when a new mission comes up. And he doesn't even want to work on a big James Webb telescope. He likes working on a small project because he likes going through the whole life cycle in a four to five year period. So, so for those folks, they love it and they get a reputation and then they get immediately put on another mission and they walk through the life cycle again and they bring all their experience from one mission to the next. So that works out tr great for the agency because you get these kind of seasoned system engineers who have worked on a whole bunch of missions and brought their experience. So, and then, but then again, some I've worked at headquarters, and that's where Lisa and I first met for about 10 years of my career. And I think at each time that I was at headquarters, I stayed for four or five years, and I started the long for the life cycle completion. So, you know, at headquarters, you only see the pre-phase A, the beginning part, and, you know, so I started to really want to be back in an environment where I had a small team around me. We kind of formed a family, and we kind of went through all the stress and strain to get to a launch pad where you can watch a rocket launch and think, hey, we just did that as a group of individuals. So so I think there are people who dip back and forth, too. So I love being on the strategic end of it, but I think after a while I start to burn out, and then I want to run back out to a center and, and take on a, another kind of role. So, so people do both, too. It's not like you have to make one track or the other your career choice. Although I will add that I know from my personality type, I'm an INTJ, that I am definitely meant for the formulation period. That's where if not all of my career has been. So I even worked on JWST back in 1997 through 2000 here at Goddard. But that's when it was in formulation and we were doing all the trade studies and we had three different design concepts. And I know that's what I'm better at. I, I love looking at all the options and weighing those options and helping the whole team and working with the scientists in the front end. And even now at headquarters, what I get to do and see in these larger strategy mission meetings, it's all formulation. And that's what I know I'm good at and that that's where I tend to, to work. And, it's, and that's what's important to you as an engineer is to know what you're really good at. You don't have to do the whole life cycle. There are opportunities in your career where you can just work formulation, but you have to know and understand that and then look for those opportunities. Yeah, so I'm, I'm an ENFP, so <laughs> I think, yeah, for me it's all about, I like that family thing, so I'm still friends with people who I launched missions with back in the 90s, so I think for me it's all about um, kind of forming these small teams, and I love being the leader, but, but kind of encouraging everyone and organizing and getting in the middle of the fights along the way and trying to settle the disagreements and you know it's kind of like I enjoy the manic depressive lifestyle of a project manager where one day everything's going great and I'm just so happy and then the next day the total train wreck and we're never going to get to the launch pad and then the next day is the opposite so so yeah you're right it's it's depending on personality it it's maybe puts you where you want you know where, guides you to where you might want to feel more most comfortable in your career thanks guys that's great I mean I think that's I'm sure good news for a number of students who have the, you know, the such different types of personalities, but you know, they can fit in in a ton of different ways into a big project. Um, so another question that we got from a student just now, um, Daniel, he kind of asks, and maybe Lisa, this would be better to start with you. Um, he asks how the two of you got involved in this particular uh, this project, the Space Systems Engineering course that they're all wrapping up now. Um, I, Lisa, maybe you can start because you were involved uh, earlier on than Jeff, I remember. So. Sure, sure. So um, those of you who have been taking the course, you've seen John Mather in interviews in some of the units, and maybe you participated in uh, his recent hangout. 
So, as I mentioned, I used to work on JWST, so John Mather and I have been colleagues over the years, and John knew that I had developed uh, the more involved undergraduate space systems engineering course at the University of Texas in Austin. And so he called me while I was in transition from Austin back here to Washington, D.C., and uh, he did a recent effort with Sailor Foundation and thought, hey, this MOOC concept, it's going wild. Why don't we try to do that with your space systems engineering course? So it was really through John Mather's uh, interest and a love of the MOOC concept that he roped me in, and we spent time with David here uh, over last summer really contemplating what would that mean. Um, as I mentioned, the University of Texas course uh, is much more um, developed. It's a full semester long course, 25 units, as opposed to the six that we developed here. So what we've done for you guys is just a pilot a sampling of some of those units. Um, I knew that Jeff was teaching the space systems engineering course that I developed here locally at a school called Capital College. And so knowing that he's currently teaching it and also working on a mission and much closer to uh, applications of systems engineering than I am right now at NASA, uh, thought he would be a great representative uh, for the course. So, so, so yeah, and, and remember, so if you didn't know, so Lisa used to be my boss. Mm -hmm. So I still do whatever she asks me to do. So, <laughs> um, so, so yeah, I think, you know, we had worked together before. Um, I had started to teach the curriculum that she developed down in Austin. And so when the opportunity came up, I jumped at it. Because I think, you know, I've been teaching college classes for about 11 years now. And I really enjoy the teaching aspect of uh, engineering because kind of feel like when I was going through this as a young engineer, I didn't have MOOCs, I didn't have all these kind of ways that you can interact with people and help them understand what system engineering is and how to apply it. And so, I, you know, the, any opportunity I get to do stuff like this has just been fantastic. So I had an opportunity to, to uh, co-author a couple engineering textbooks. And so so when this came up, I'm like, yeah, I'm all in because it's, it's a kind of a neat opportunity. So, uh, so, yeah, and I do follow whatever Lisa tells me to do still. So. <laughs> Well, yeah, we're, me personally, I couldn't be more grateful that the two of you have been involved. It's been great. I mean, Lisa, it seems you mentioned that those meetings over last summer, and it seems so so strange that this is, you know, the last hangout of the course, and the course, you know, happened, and it was developed, and, you know, we had all those filming sessions with Jeff, and now we're here, and it's just, you know, it's, it's been a great process, and uh, from our perspective, it's been great to have you two involved. Um, so... Lisa, you had mentioned the uh, your full course at, at UT Austin. Um, so I think you know, kind of a big question for a lot of students at this point um, is where where do they go from here if they want to continue their space and engineering studies? Perhaps there's a few modules from your course that you could highlight that maybe would be a good next step for them to transition into from this point. So uh, I do have a website, and if you look up space, se dot spacegrant.org, and they are hosting the site, and it has all the modules from the undergraduate course. There are other modules for a graduate level course, and there are also examples of student theses uh, from University of Texas related to systems engineering, mostly about how do you apply systems engineering to CubeSats. And there are other resources on that site. So, you know, it's open to anyone, and you can learn as much as you'd like. But, you know, it's self-motivated, right? Um, Otherwise, uh, I know a lot of universities have picked this up, but it's part of formal curriculum. Like I said, it's uh, become a prerequisite for capstone, or it's integrated into capstone. So for those of you not in a accredited engineering program, um, all engineers in a university program have to take a final capstone design course. 
and that course is like the culmination of all your learning. And the professors will put forward a design challenge, um, whether it's a paper design or an actual build project of physical design. Um, where my course has been uh, mostly used in other universities is integrating these modules into the capstone learning. So as they're actually doing a hands-on build, they're, they're applying all these processes and techniques. So they're doing a concept of operations on whatever they're going to build. They're writing requirements of whatever they're going to build before they build it. Uh, they're doing trade studies before they actually go off and build whatever they're going to design. So a good example of this, because Jeff and I have both been involved, NASA sponsors uh, the Robotics Mining Challenge, and it used to be called Lunabotics. Um, but universities from all over the country, they select 50 schools into this competition, and they're building lunar excavator automated vehicles. And as part of that challenge, you know, before they come to um, Kennedy Space Center to actually test and then compete against each other in this challenge, they have to write a systems engineering paper. And that paper has to count for all these things you have learned in this course plus more, what, you know, that's in the rest of my course. And they get judged on their paper and they get points towards that paper that help with the big award at the end of the competition. So here at NASA, we've not only provided this curriculum, worked it, put it out on a, um, a website, integrated it into other universities, but now make it part of their learning through these university-level challenges. Yeah, so, so and if you look at Lisa's uh, material, so think about it, what we learned in the first maybe four or five modules, getting into requirements, right? So at the beginning, we were learning things like the whole life cycle. What does it mean? How is it broken up? And then some really high-level things like the scoping exercise and stuff. But so the scoping exercise and then requirements and then trade studies starts to kind of lead you to what the rest of the modules are like, right? So you're now taking individual things that you would do within the life cycle, like you do requirements development in phase A and phase B, and kind of going deeper into, well, how do you do requirements development? How do you make sure you manage requirements? What kinds of requirements are there? And so then, like, um, Unit 6 was trade studies, right? So same thing. In Phase B and in Phase C and even in Phase A, there's a trade studies going on at different levels. So it was a deeper dive into trade studies. So if you looked at the rest of the modules that Lisa developed for the course, there's a lot of those other deep dive subjects. So how do you do risk management while you're progressing through the life cycle to manage those things you worry about in a more structured way than just saying, hey, I'm worried. You know, how do you actually make use of that worry and put it into a structured environment and then work it off so that you don't have the launch get slipped or you don't overrun your budget? So, so there's a lot of those kind of subjects, uh, make versus buy. You know, there's a whole module on would you want to make a product, a gyroscope, or would you be better off to go off and buy it on the market for your specific satellite. So again, trying to add that structure, you might intuitively say, well, I could figure out how to do that. But it's like, well, what Lisa's material kind of walks you through is, well, what's a structured way to do that so that the decision you make in the end has a little bit more analysis and depth to it than just saying, well, off the top of my head, I'd rather buy it because it makes it easier for me or I think it'll be cheaper. So, so I think that's what you'd find if you go through the rest of the modules. You know, you're going from this big picture of the whole life cycle down into what are specific tools that, and processes that you can use at different points in the life cycle to kind of work your way through and, and handle different kinds of issues that come up. So, Jeff, is that what you would suggest if someone wants to further their knowledge after this course to dive deeper into every single topic that they've covered rather than expanding into other modules? Hey, hey, David, I, I'm, I, I'm uh, very self-centered, so I say, no, they should all sign up to take courses at Capital College, and I could be their teacher in person. But, but okay, like, let's say they couldn't do that, right? They don't happen to live in Maryland or want to migrate here. So, yeah, it's, that's probably exactly what to do is pick topics that you're interested in or that you have questions about. When you look at the topics on Lisa's website, it's going to be intuitive. You'll see uh, risk management. Um, it's like trade studies and make versus buy. So you'll, you'll get it. You know, cost, 
right? One of the things we didn't cover, which is critical to a system engineer, is understanding cost management in the life cycle because system engineers are not just purely thinking about technical subjects. They're thinking about the cost implication of those technical decisions. So, so there's a cost module, but so I think by name it would be pretty easy to noodle through, oh yeah, that's what that's going to cover. But again, it'll kind of help you understand different aspects. So if you're somebody who is working on something or would like to work on something in a more of a phase CD, kind of a, a building and integrating environment, there are some of the modules on Lisa's course that are more relevant to that part of the life cycle. If you like the idea or want to learn more about what it's like to start a new project from scratch, then there are things that tend to lend themselves to the beginning of the life cycle. And again, I think when you see the names of the modules, it'll be intuitive to kind of to figure out which ones you might want to, to learn more about. That's or come great. to Capital College, David. That's the other choice. So. Yeah. Come, we'll, we'll put over, once this video is uploaded and finalized on YouTube, we'll put a big link to uh, Capital yeah. College enrollment right over this yeah, entire section. Another course into my college, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so another question that we have um, from Angelique, this is uh, content specific. It's about the, the MSR project. Um, and she's wondering if you could provide an example of figure of merit. Um, she's just saying that the, the concept still is a little obscure to her. Sure. So, so let me, and, and we'll, we can both talk about this, but let, let me, because I've actually had some students inquiring about the, the project. So let me uh, maybe take a broader tack at this first, is that people have said, well, what, what, is, what should I do? I mean, the JPL, uh, I think there's a link out there to the JPL mission design that they currently have for if NASA someday did a Mars sample return, here's kind of our baseline concept. But now, and Lisa could talk to James Webb, they said in the James Webb example, there were many, there was a government baseline design, but then people came up with different variations and different ways to do it. And so that was part of the beginning kind of pre-phase A, uh, uh, looking at different options, right? So, so this is exactly what I'm hoping the students will do with the Mars sample return is that, sure, there's a JPL example baseline mission, and sure, there are laws of physics that are built into that that you don't want to violate, right? So whatever design you come up with probably has to follow a lot of the similar, you know, uh, how much mass you could take to Mars and how long it will take to get to Mars. You, you're probably not going to be able to change those things too dramatically. But what you could think about is, well, you know, I don't want to just sit down with a, a rover that picks up rocks in a local area because I've learned about Mars and I know that there are a lot of very interesting locations I would love to get samples from the poles. I'd love to get samples from uh, Olympus Mons. I'd love to get samples from deep in one of the, the valleys. So maybe you design something that puts out a bunch of little probes that pick up samples from different areas, and then they maybe helicopter those samples back to a location where the rocket brings them all back. Or you know, So I'm, I'm really hoping students will kind of take the basic design of the JPL mission and start to think about what could you do differently that would make the mission more exciting, more interesting technically, scientifically? And so, so I think that's the part where system engineers always work within some amount of boundary conditions, and they try to leverage as much past experience as possible. So knowing what JPL's baseline mission is, knowing what the Curiosity rover has been able to do and what it's, you know, how it works, those are all key to designing your mission because you can't just come up with the most fanciful idea you want and have it be practically and you know practical to execute. So, but but so that's what I'm really hoping is that I, I feel like the ones that should get the most votes should be the ones that follow all the engineering disciplines, but they also add that creativity that maybe other students hadn't thought about. So, so so to go all the way back down into how do you think about figures of merit, right? So the idea here is that when you're doing trades along the way, and I think one of the core things I've at, I've told students who have asked about this project is. I'd, I'd like to see that you've learned something from the course, so I'd like to see your project design or your layout, you know, really map to the different modules and what you've learned in the course. So, so I think doing something like showing that you've done a trade study and applied figures of merit is a great, you know, is one great way to do that, right? So for figures of merit, it could be anything that you would want to use to evaluate uh, multiple choices that you would ha have, like say, uh, you want to decide whether it should be a rover that collects the samples, or a helicopter, or an airplane, or a uh, you know underground boring machine, or whatever, and that you put those all on a list and say, okay, here are all the different ways I think I could collect samples from around the Martian environment. Now, which one of those take the most electrical power? 
So that's maybe one figure of merit is which ones take more power. So, so you have a power as a figure of merit, and then you say, boy, on Mars, I want to use, I can only use solar power, so I can only have a certain amount available. So if one of these applications would need a lot of power, that might not be good. It might not be a, a good one to pick. But there might be a lot of other factors. So maybe another figure to merit is how heavy it is, right? So maybe building a rover might be very heavy, where a helicopter, you could build a design that would be very lightweight. And so you know that taking mass to Mars is very difficult. It takes a big rocket to get it there. So maybe a figure of merit is, I want to understand how much mass each one of these type of collecting devices would take. So I don't know, maybe there's some more of that. I don't know, you know, so what are, uh, well, you could also take it from a qualitative view as well. As Jeff said, you know, can your concept um, support getting samples from lots of different locations? So now you've got a variety of samples. So that would be a, a good figure of merit. Also, um, sample size. So some of the concepts NASA has done, and I know I've seen them, you end up like with dust particles. And we think, oh my god, it's not worth doing this multi-billion dollar mission just to get some dust back. You know, at least it'll be a rock, right? But, you know, what could your um, concept afford in terms of sample size? So those are more qualitative, but again, it lends itself to know, is this mission worth it? Is this a valuable mission? Yeah, so a, lot, so a lot of times what people will do is develop a, 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 like a spreadsheet. So and then they'll put all the choices for, like in this case, uh, ways to collect samples. And then they'll have all of their figures of merit on the other axis. And then they'll go through and say, okay, and again, it could be qualitative or quantitative. They'll write something in each box, like uh, if one of the measures is how much samples could be collected with that uh, mechanism, they'll put in, you know, okay, for a helicopter system that goes off to these places, I could bring back this much samples for a rover, I could bring about this much samples back. So, so then this way when you get done, you've got this big matrix and you've got all these different things where maybe some of your choices scored better in certain figures of merit. They would really do well in the amount of samples brought back. But that same choice might use a lot of electrical power. So then you're like, well, oh, geez, I got... And maybe you start to filter it down, and maybe there's not a clear-cut winner, but maybe two of the choices look a lot better than all the others. So then you say, okay, maybe I need a couple more figures of merit to add to the list to maybe draw out the differences between these two final ones to make the decision. So, so I think it can be an iterative process, too, where you try to go through, maybe down-select a little based on a few figures of merit, and then do more deeper analysis on the couple remaining. So. And I will add one more thing because I've had a flashback. One of my first jobs in the 80s when I got out of grad school was to design the sample canister for a Mars sample return mission. So believe it or not, way back then we thought we were going to do this. And Martin Marietta was the lead contractor back then and we were a subcontractor where I was working. And we had the idea that we wanted more samples. So I was designing this hexagonal sam sample canister so you could separate the samples you were receiving but launch it off of one canister. But then, you know, we'd show our design to Mark Marietta and in the end it wasn't good because the mass penalty of something like that was too great given they were designing the bigger return vehicle. So. It's interesting, okay. you, you know, what we thought was the valuable um, design parameter, get lots of samples and have them segregated in one system. You know, thinking about the mass penalty wasn't what we were doing at the time. So I know what's really shocking is that we've been around since the 80s. I know that's shocking. <laughs> <laughs> but we actually worked together back then, too. So that was like our first, we didn't really know each other, but we were both working on sending humans to the moon and Mars. Um, Lisa was down at Johnson Space Center. I was up at NASA headquarters at the time. And so we were doing system engineering back then of concepts for how do you get humans to Phobos, how do you get humans down to the surface of Mars. So, so yeah, so uh, things like a Mars sample return have been studied and studied and studied. Mm -hmm. But it'll be great to see what you guys come up with because there's always some room for some creative new ideas because technology has changed a lot since the 80s when we first started. So, so I bet you there's a lot of new cool things you could think of doing in a sample return 
that there were, you know people didn't think about years ago. So, thanks, guys. Um, so, next question. Uh, I'm not too sure how much either of you know about this particular thing, um, but. The question is uh, just how effective do you think the new uh, space-specific universities such as the International Space University in Strasbourg are going to be with regard to the advancement of human space exploration? Um, and how do you think their production of students with space-specific knowledge will help boost the space economy in the future? You talk there. So let's yeah. See. So believe it or not, the International Space University started in the 80s. And I was actually asked to teach at the very first offering for students. And MIT hosted ISU for the first time. And it has been consistently teaching students ever since. Uh, I have encountered graduates from that university. They mm -hmm. tend to be more in policy positions and international relations positions. And in fact, I have recently been involved in an effort that the Swiss government, using the Swiss embassy here uh, in Washington, um, is interested in building these relationships and awareness of space. And the leader of that conference is a graduate of ISU. And so coming from those um, types of universities, I think it's wonderful. They have a full awareness of what space offers. All the international players, um, our particular um, working group with the Swiss Embassy is geared towards how can we influence the future economy by making the most use of space. So they take it at a different level. They're trying to teach their students not just a technical awareness, but all these other factors, you know, the economy, the international relations, the communication side of getting the public behind space. And, and so the people I've met who have come from ISU have just been in these invaluable positions, um, which sometimes the, the dyed-in-the-wool engineer, we're, we're not as good at the communicating or the reaching out to convince people space is good. We just think it's good and everyone should know that. Um, whereas I think the International Space University people, they really come out with this global view and how to communicate the value of space. Yeah, and, and I think just to add on to that, I've worked with a lot of folks who have gone to ISU, and so I think what happens is they, um, they get put in a very uh, condensed environment. It's kind of like working on a project team where they get to know people from around the world very quickly and they form bonds. So a lot of times what I'll see is that once they come out of like an ISU environment, they keep their connections. So that over their career, they're like, oh yeah, I know somebody that works in France or I know somebody that works in Italy. A lot of us engineers have never been exposed to that kind of broad you know, community of the aerospace world. We only know our little area. So, so I think those ISU folks have not only are they good because they do learn the policy side and the outreach side and all the other aspects, but that they also form this kind of web of, of former ISU alumni who all keep in touch and kind of, you know, keep their relationships and that helps them in their jobs later too. So it's very different than a normal engineering curriculum at, an, at a regular university in the U.S. In fact, uh, Jeff and I used to work international relations for NASA um, with respect to sending humans to the moon and Mars and we would go to Europe quite a bit and work with the European Space Agency and I know our lead liaison to the European Space Agency came from ISU and he knew a lot of different people right. much more aware than we were um, and a great colleague to work with. I really valued that. Yeah. And, and if you think it's difficult working just within a small project team, when you have to work, yeah, what, what we were doing with the international community, you're A, working at a strategic level, and you're working engineering problems. So what we were doing was trying to promote this idea that the exploration of the moon and Mars future should all be collaborative among nations. And so, you know, they all had to deal with their international or their national politics, right, their governments. And so we would get together as a team and we talk about, well, 
if we send a rover to the moon, would you guys want to send a lander with it and do something and do some samples? And But then they all had to go build advocacy back in their home countries. And when you bring all those cultures together and try to work, that's where I think ISU grads really come in handy because a lot of times I think there were challenges for me I hadn't worked a lot of international to be able to communicate with folks from Japan and folks from Europe and culturally understand kind of how do you reach agreements and how do you work through issues and stuff like that. So, so yeah, that's where definitely ISU folks come in handy. And I'll add one more thing. A good colleague of ours from the Johnson Space Center, he just started this month uh, rotating into a leadership role with ISU to develop their curriculum. And this allows uh, NASA to bring our design challenges into the ISU curriculum. And he'll be um, on that tenure for three years. So it'll have a NASA flavor right now, and then they'll rotate off that leadership and pick another country. Yeah, because not everybody follows the exact NASA life cycle. <laughs> so, for example, right, so you throw phase B out, and the Japanese are looking at you like, phase B, I'm not quite sure. I worked with NASA. I think I know. So so that is a big challenge, is that everyone kind of does the same engineering life cycle, more or less, yeah. but terminology and the way you go about it and the way you get your government to support it is very different in different countries. And so that could be, and I think more and more of these big, missions that we're talking about, whether you're going out to uh, dive under Europa and figure out if there's water and stuff, and or big human missions to Mars, those are going or Mars sample return, those are going to have to be international missions. So mm -hmm. more and more, it's not just that one country can have all the, uh, the the resources required to pull off a mission like that. So so it is critical for folks to be able to understand how to work in an international environment. That's great. That's great. Um, Jeff, maybe uh, you can start off with this next question because you know you kind of lectured on some of this material in the beginning of the course um, about how systems engineering started. But another question that we had is how has systems engineering developed with time since the Apollo mission, and how do you think it will evolve, uh, continue to evolve in the future? Yeah. So David, I, I think you know, um, you know. So like, take my mission for example. So I'm way smaller. The mission we're working on tests to, to send a small, it's a $200 million mission, the spacecraft that sells $200 million, which in NASA parlance is a pretty small mission. Um, the life cycle is only five years long. It's physically, you know, no bigger than your dining room table, so it's not a giant spacecraft. It's only got one scientific instrument, and that's a set of uh, four identical cameras that are going to look for these exoplanets uh, around other stars. So it's a very straightforward mission, pretty small scale. We don't have a lot of time to go from beginning to end. So when you when we used Apollo examples and we talked about the development of a system engineering process in Apollo for NASA, that was kind of predicated on these gigantic missions that had people all over the country, nowadays all over the world, trying to combine to form a team and to do different pieces of something that all then have to come back together. And the life cycle may take 10 years or 20 years or 30 years to go from pre-phase A all the way, like on space station, took almost 30 years to go from pre-phase A all the way to completion on orbit. So, so the process was developed with that in mind, but, you know, over time we've kind of adapted it to all the different kinds of missions that NASA flies. And so Lisa and I were talking about just right before we came over that there's still work at NASA to try to figure out, as we do these smaller missions, how do you adapt the principles of system engineering and the processes that you guys have been learning about in the course, but don't overburden a mission with too much paperwork and process and bureaucracy that may not always be value added when you don't have a long time to get to the launch pad and you've designed the mission to be simple and straightforward. So maybe you don't need all of the process. You can streamline some of the process that you guys learned about. So I think that's what's happening is that you know, you're trying to make the process not be one size fits all, but where can you customize it and still be safe where you don't run too much risk that you're going to overrun your budget or overrun your schedule, run into technical difficulties that can't be solved. So you don't want to lower the bar too far, and then all of a sudden you've got all these missions that can't complete, and they're being run at too high a risk. But on the other side, you can't always take that full life cycle that we've talked about with all of the bells and whistles of process and lay it on a smaller mission. So the other thing that comes up is, you know, I was mentioning, uh, you know, moons of Saturn or Jupiter that might have water under ice or whatever. 
is that we have to learn how to make the process go fast enough to be nimble to be able to kind of react to these things, right? So science is changing all the time. So you set out to build a certain telescope or a certain rover, and then as time is going by, if that life cycle is taking too long, other scientific discoveries might come along and you're like, oh wow, I wish we would have known that because we're not nimble enough maybe to go back and make changes to that rover to explore something different or whatever. So, so I think NASA has to continue to evolve the life cycle process and, and as well as others to kind of make it more nimble so that you can kind of quickly react to some new scientific discovery comes up, like the whole area of exoplanets. And then you can put the resources into it and quickly fly missions that could help you learn more and more about that subject matter. So, so I think within NASA, we're constantly trying to make the process streamline where it can be and then make sure that we keep enough checks and balances in it, make sure that we're successful and then run the least risk of a mission failure. But I think the other part of this is that space is becoming more and more a commercial endeavor as much as it is a NASA endeavor. So I think what's happening when you look at a, a, some of these young companies that are starting up, they're taking what NASA has done in the past and they're using the life cycle as kind of a starting point. But a lot of them are morphing it and changing it to work in a more cost competitive environment and an environment, again, where they want to be nimble, get to uh, market before somebody else does, capture a bigger market share. So, so I think that's, that's going to be part of it, too, is that as time goes by, the engineering process, the, the key tenets will remain the same, but it will be morphed and changed. If you went to work for a SpaceX, you went to work for Virgin Galactic, you'll see the basic premises underneath of developing something and getting it to, to uh, an operational product, but you'll also notice they'll probably make a lot of changes to adapt to their environment where they want to streamline things and maybe get to the market quicker. I will add one thing that uh, just over time, uh, in order to uh, manipulate the processes like development of requirements and configuration management of requirements, there have been many software tools that have been developed. I know DOORS is one that we've used at NASA. So the advent of these types of automated tools really helps streamline the effort of tracking requirements, communicating requirements, controlling them. And so I, I see a future where there's more tool accessibility to make the processes easier and also do the streamlining. So we're not all doing it by hand like they did in the Apollo program. Right. Yeah, so like, so it's a good example is that for configuration management on the mission that I'm, I'm with now, we have a configuration control database here at Goddard. So whether you're building the spacecraft at Orbital Sciences or you're building the instrument up at MIT, you come to Goddard, we have one configuration control database that everyone has access to remotely, you can get all the current documentation, and then there's an automated system that keeps track of when documents are updated, when a new release has been made, emails automatically go out to people. So, so I think it now with a very distributed environment, a distributed system is that somebody has an old copy of a document and they're building the instrument to that old copy of the document while the person somewhere else building the spacecraft the other side of the interface is building to the newer version of the document, and when you get the two together, they don't plug together. So, so yeah, I think there's a lot of tools like that that are really helping us stay more under control and, mm -hmm. and really are an aid where you don't have to have people doing a lot of that kind of work. So. Thanks, guys. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me. So we probably have time for just one more question. Um, and this was something that uh, someone asked on Tuesday to Dr. Mather and Mike. Um, I think it's a really great question, though, so I'll pose it to you two as well. Um, but uh, Arvin asks, if you could just pass on you know, one piece of advice for your successors who are going to continue to tackle complex space systems uh, projects, what would that, that one thing be? Um, maybe, Lisa, you can start with that one. <laughs> uh. You know, I think it's get to know your colleagues and really value what they have to offer. I, I'll, I'll give you an anecdote. When I was teaching at University of Texas, all the assignments you guys do, I made students do in teams because what do you do in the aerospace world? We, we work in large teams, small teams. We're always working together. And one of my students said, 
no, I want to do these assignments by myself. I was homeschooled. I can do everything on my own. And I said, look, do you think we launch the shuttle? Do I get to launch the shuttle by myself? You know, if you're going to graduate and enter the aerospace industry, you need to work as a team. And you need to understand why all those team members are valued because you cannot know it all. And together, your thoughts, your ideas, your, your work effort is much more valuable. And that's how you get to your positive end products that we have at NASA. And look at Jeff and I have had a history over, over 25 years knowing each other or working on similar projects. And look, when this opportunity to do the, the sailor course came up, I can call Jeff up and he's still one of my valued colleagues. And I have hundreds of valued colleagues across the agency. I thought I was the only one. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so that's that's yeah. my advice is you know just and you learn from your colleagues so you don't have time to keep taking courses and staying on top of things but you know my getting to work with a John Mather in my career I learned so much and you know we still have a relationship and we can still move things forward and so it's it's really um, networking but keeping those networks active and valuing what those people in the network have to offer. So, so let's see, I, I guess from my side it would be um, definitely always have passion for what you're doing. If you find that you're in an area where it's becoming drudgery and you're, you're feeling like this isn't the right thing for you, switch to something you think you have passion for because it's the only thing that's going to keep you going for a long career is that you really believe, because there's going to be these really bad days and these really times when you're like, oh my gosh, NASA's going nowhere. You know, you get down in the dumps, and but it's like you have this passion and this thing that you believe that you've got to be part of this, that there's some good outcome that's going to come out of it, even when you're going through the dark days. So, And then the other thing about it, too, is that, um, it, you know, not, not only having passion for it, but being, you know, I, lemmings are cute, right? They're very cute, but don't be a lemming either, right? So I find that in a big organization like NASA, where you've had all this history. You know, when Lisa and I were working on trying to go back to the moon and Mars, all the Apollo folks would come back and say, you got to do it the way we did it, because we were very successful. And I'm like, oh, my goodness gracious. I mean, I have tons of respect for those people, and, I, and what they did was incredible in their day. But I think that you can't, and you can't in this industry be a lemming. You can't assume that if you just listen to what people did before or what people are telling you, it's the right thing to do. So it's like the Mars sample return that I was talking about before. Yeah, there's a JPL baseline, but that doesn't mean that your creativity can't say, no, I don't think that a, a rover picking up samples in a one kilometer zone for all the money we got to pay to send it there is the right first Mars sample return. I think we need polar ice cap, uh, cap samples. I think we need you know samples from a diverse part of the geology of Mars. So so I think that's the, that's the biggest thing is if you want to be in this field, you can't just follow along, and you have to have some sense of, you know, you're always constantly learning. You're out there finding out about new things. I'm actually taking a couple of MOOCs myself right now to learn from other engineers and scientists about new things happening in the solar system. So you're always out learning, but then you're kind of taking all that data and coming up with your own ideas and opinions. So as, as much as the learning from others and listening to others and making sure you hear those voices is critical, I think it's also critical to kind of develop your own sense of, you know, what, what do you think should be done? And then to be passionate enough to argue about that. So I, I've had probably um, 15 jobs. This might sound bad. I'm trying to gauge how bad this will sound. I've had like 15 jobs in the last almost 30 years. But, but there have been times where I've stopped working at a job. I've quit because I feel like I, A, don't have passion for it, or B, don't believe in what the team is doing. And so I think you always have to be ready to do that, to say, you know, I, I never do that until I feel like I've exhausted all options. But but I always feel like you always have to have that sense of, you know, I am I believe and I have passion and, and I want to see the team succeed, but that, you know, you have to figure out how to how to make that, uh, how to drive that course. So, so yeah, 15 jobs in 20, in almost 30 years, that's... <laughs> <laughs> but but they've been great jobs, and I know all the people from all those jobs. And and to Lisa's point, I still network with all those people. We go out to lunch and and all that, and I've learned a ton from those people. So um, but so the 
the path of system engineering and how you follow it, it can be very circuitous at times. I have been a life support engineer. I've been a strategic planning person, worked on the NASA strategic plan, done humans to Mars studies and, and all the specifics of that, worked on a, a small project out here. So, yeah, I don't know that there's even to pass on anything about what path to take. It's kind of like you just kind of evolve as you go through and you figure out what's the next best thing for you to apply your knowledge but then to drive yourself to learn more and then and it's something you have some passion for, something you really believe in. That's great. Um, well, thank you so much to both. Um, I guess to kind of just wrap up, um, I know a few people uh, have asked about the part two for the course and that's something that myself and, and Lisa and Jeff um, and uh, the other members of our team that have worked to put this this uh, course together for you that you've all been taking. Well, we're going to be meeting up and talking about that in the next, you know, one or two months or so here. And so that'll be uh, it's TBD for now, but we will definitely, uh, hopefully, you know, well, it's something we need to talk about and see where we're all going um, with that. Um, but even if it doesn't happen, um, like Lisa mentioned, her course, uh, the Space Grant, we can uh, post a link to that over this video afterwards, but that has all the material that you could ever want for continuing your space systems engineering knowledge, so definitely go there um, and continue diving deeper into these subjects and even other topics that you might have interest in, do that. Um, and also, Jeff and Lisa, I want to convey all the thank yous that we've gotten from students to you two specifically for all the work that you've put into this course. Um, it seems a lot of people are, are very much appreciative of your efforts. Um, hopefully it was well worth it to you too, Jeff, even though I'm, you just learned that you know, you're not Lisa's only valuable colleague, so hopefully it wasn't a small <laughs> experience. You know? Um, we'll get over it, I guess. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, so, so David, I, I want to thank you guys too, because uh, Sailor's been fantastic to work with. So you and, and Zev in particular have been a great help to us and Turning, you know, when we looked at Lisa's course, how do you teach it online? I think we just thought you just teach it just the way she had laid it out, and that is exactly not what you do. So it's you guys have been very helpful in kind of guiding us on how you turn that into something that's uh, digestible in the form that you need it for what you're doing. So, and and the other thing, I'll just one one small thing is I hope every student that's taken this course knows what was important that happened this week, and that was uh, if you saw on the news, Mars opposition occurred. And so I didn't use the word opposition in Unit 6, but when we were talking about sending humans to Mars and long stay versus short stay, we talked about that sometimes Mars is on the same side of the sun as the Earth, and that the two are, you know, there's the sun and then the Earth and then Mars all in a line, and that's when Mars is closest, and that's when you'd like to get there with the shortest amount of, lowest amount of propellant. So that just happened here this week. And when you put that in perspective, so if you saw in the news that Mars opposition occurs occurred this week, that meant that Mars was on the opposite side of the Earth from the Sun, so it was Mars opposition. But the other thing to think about is um, just a number of months ago, the MAVEN spacecraft, as well as the, the MOM spacecraft from India, both took off to go to Mars. They specifically took off close to now because of that Mars opposition. So, so I would encourage all the students who are taking this class to then take what you're learning and then try to look for this stuff in the news or whatever to put it in better context to, you know, from what we learned in the class. That's great. Um, all right, well then, I guess that about wraps this, this uh, last Hangout up. Um, so everyone just focus on the Mars sample return and get those turned in by Friday and that'll wrap up this course. So Lisa and Jeff, thank you so much for taking the time out today. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Bye.